ETF Prime is hosted by investment advisors of the ETF Store. This program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. The ETF Store is not affiliated with ETF.com or any of its affiliates. ETF.com's participation in this program should not be construed as an endorsement or an indication by ETF.com of the value of any ETF Store product or service. Visit ETFStore.com for more information. Now it's time for ETF Prime, where we discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Jason will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of ETF Prime, Nate Geraci. Welcome to ETF Prime, Nate Geraci and Jason Lank in studio. As always, thank you so much for joining us. We have a packed show today. In just a moment, we'll be joined by Dave Nottig, Managing Director of ETF.com. We'll discuss gold and gold ETFs. Of course, there has been a lot more volatility in the markets this year. Inflation also seems to be on investors' minds. And so with that, there's been a meaningful uptick in gold ETF demand. We're going to visit with Dave about the recent flows into gold ETFs. We'll also touch on gold mining ETFs. And then ETF.com recently had what I found to be a very interesting piece on how Bitcoin might ultimately impact gold demand. So we'll visit with that or visit about that as well. Also on the program today will be Matt Markovich, Managing Director of Innovation Shares. He's going to spotlight one of the new blockchain ETFs. This ETF actually uses artificial intelligence to select holdings. It's called the Innovation Shares Next Gen Protocol ETF. So Matt will join us in the back half of the program. And then to sort of bridge the gap in between, Jason and I will spend a few minutes uh, of our own talking Bitcoin and blockchain. So things have been a bit quieter surrounding Bitcoin recently. Obviously, it's down significantly this year, so that's a big part of it. But there were some comments from research affiliates uh, we want to share with you. And then we'll also recap where we currently stand on Bitcoin ETFs. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can visit ETFprime.com or you can find us on Twitter at Nate Geraci and at Jason Lank. All right, let's start the show today with ETF.com's Dave Nottig. Time now for our weekly chat with the experts at ETF.com, the world's leading independent authority on ETF. People have been saying there are too many mutual funds since the 80s. For all the talk of smart data, they haven't pulled in huge assets. The active managers are showing up in the ETF space. Dave, welcome. Looking forward to our chat on gold today. Yeah, it's always great to get back to the yellow metal, right? <laughs> well, look, I know the two largest physical gold ETFs, the Spider Gold Shares, ticker GLD, and the iShares Gold Trust, ticker IAU, they both have seen nice inflow so far this year. Give us some color here, how it flows compared to last year and also just relative to other areas of the market. Well, last year was a rout uh, on, on anything related to gold. Um, gold didn't perform particularly well. Um, there were basically flat to negative inflows uh, on and outflows in, in most of the, the sort of gold complex. And this year, um, we had uh, we've had about 3.6 billion ish coming into the physical gold ETFs, which is about 8 percent of their assets. That's a lot of money flowing in in a pretty short period of time. Now, obviously, you know we've had eras in the past where GLD was the largest ETF on the planet. Um, those days have long since passed us, but we've really seen this major uptick uh, year to date and really April. April was a big month, almost $2 billion flowing into physical gold. Any difference between the flows into GLD versus IAU? You know, they both had uh, really solid, solid uh, sort of quarters year to date. Um, but it, uh, interestingly, IAU is the one that really has been winning. And there's a, there's a price differential there. It's substantially cheaper. So you would expect over the long term buy and hold investors to migrate towards the cheaper product. 
Now, GLD uh, still remains sort of the trader's darling. Some of that has to do with the handle, the actual price of IAU being, uh, you know, one-tenth that of GLD. Uh, that makes GLD cheaper for big institutions to put lots of money to work. But for most mom-and-pop investors, IAU is going to be the cheaper choice, and that's where we're seeing the flows. What about some of the smaller physical gold ETFs? So SGOL, Ounce, I know there was a new launch from Granite Shares last year, ticker symbol BAR. Have there been inflows across the board here? It pretty much is across the board. Um, you know, you, you have to you have to dig to some funds folks probably haven't even heard of, like the uh, the Long Dollar Gold Trust and and some of the very small sort of ten million dollar funds to find any that didn't get inflow. So, you know, you mentioned Granite Shares Gold Trust, uh, Gold Shares. That's one of the cheapest ways to get access to gold. Uh, it, it had ten million dollars in flows. You know, it, that pales in comparison to the two billion year to date and things like IAU. Uh, but there's definitely room for competition. Yeah. You mentioned the fee differential with IAU and then, of course, with the Granite Shares ETF uh, undercutting uh, both GLD and IAU. I believe it's at 20 basis points. Since all of these ETFs are backed by physical gold, isn't price really the only differentiator outside of just trading spreads and, and, and liquidity? I guess point being, wouldn't you expect more flows into the Granite Shares product at some point? Yeah, over time, like I said, over time, I think you would expect money to migrate towards the cheapest alternative in any given segment of the market. Um, Now, gold investors are a little bit unique. A lot of gold investors are focused on gold, not just because of its sort of asset class properties, its counter-correlation properties, but because they see it as kind of a guns and butter safety play for, uh, for major market turmoil or maybe even major political turmoil. And because of that, uh, people will often make choices about how they hold gold that aren't purely economic, that aren't just going to be based on cost. So you know, that's part of the reason we've been, seen things like SGOL, which is the ETFS physical Swiss gold shares ETF, actually have some success, even though at 40 basis points, it's one of the most expensive ways to get access to gold. Dave, this is Jason Lank. The ETFs we're visiting with are all physically backed, but investors also have other options, different options. Does it say anything about the marketplace or investor psyche that they're seeking out the physically backed version, the way they get exposure? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and they, and they're doing it it's sort of at the expense of gold miners, which have had uh, a real, an actual drawdown. People have pulled money out of gold miners, not to the extent they did last year, where it was really a route, um, but the money continues to flow out of most of the gold miner ETFs. And I think that's because gold is sort of reclaiming its place as a safety asset in investors' portfolios. Uh, you know, we've seen you know, big flows into things like short-term bonds as well, and that implies a similar investor psychology. People saw the volatility of the last four months in the market. Uh, they've seen you know, these relatively flat equity markets, even in the recovery. Uh, you know, I think, I think you know, we've, we've seen uh, you know, the market flat year-to-date up a little over 2% in April. Um, that's pretty anemic, and, and with the volatility we've seen, that tends to signal a, a flight to safety, and you don't get much more safe than gold. Dave, you bring up a good point because the performance of gold hasn't exactly lit the world on fire this year. So, <laughs> so, so do you think it is as simple as increased market volatility and, and then perhaps concerns over rising inflation? Is that what's really been driving investors to gold? Well, I think, I think there are a couple of key drivers for gold demand in 2018. You know, 20, 2017 uh, was an eight-year low in, in physical gold demand. Uh, you know, really nobody wanted it, whether it was central banks or people buying jewelry. Um, you know, even in some Asian markets like India, uh, where jewelry demand is actually a big part of what drives price in, in the Indian sort of gold buying season, even that was off last year versus, you know, eight-year uh, eight runs. Uh, this year, I think we've got a couple things. Um, one is we've seen a, a real synchronization in global GDP growth. In, in other words, everything either rises or falls together much more than it has, say, 10 years ago. And since GDP is growing, the economies around the world are generally healthy, that tends to do two things. One, drive inflation, and two, uh, drive investment demand. Both of those are bullish for gold. 
Dave, if we look back over, you know, the millennia that, that the barbarous relic has, has been a, an object of attraction, it's done pretty well at hedging against inflation over time, but it's proven to be especially effective during periods of shocks in the market where people just instantly gravitate to the thing they can hold in safety. Does that say that investors might be looking over the shoulder for the unknown? Well, boy, you know, you look at what happened with VIX over the last four months, uh, and you don't have to look too hard over your shoulder to see that volatility, to see those unpleasant surprises. So, yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. And, you know, I, you know, you mentioned the long history. Well, one of the unique things about the world we live in now, and particularly about ETFs, is they give you access to a quick and very easy way of expressing that opinion. You know, putting putting a substantial portion of your wealth to work in gold, even 20 years years ago uh, was substantially more difficult than it is now. Now it's one trade. Uh, now that, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. You can obviously get hurt that way too, buying the top and selling the bottom. Uh, but if investors decide they want to be into gold in a hurry, uh, it's very easy to express that opinion. We're visiting with Dave Nodig, Managing Director of ETF.com. Dave, obviously uh, you're not here to uh, dispense investment advice, so let me say that up front. Uh, but I am curious as to how you view gold in the context of a portfolio. You know, gold seems to generate such passion among investors. They seem to either love it or hate it. How do you view gold? Yeah, you know, I, I probably have a bit of a love-hate relationship with gold myself. I think, uh, you know, it, there's no question that it is a financial asset that people use in portfolios because it has expressed counter-correlation over time, meaning it tends to zig a little bit when other assets zag. And and that's very valuable in any portfolio context. Um, now, having said that, uh, I have to put on my intellectual hat and point out that gold really doesn't have any fundamental value in in itself. It doesn't generate earnings. It doesn't get used in the industry very much. It has value because people think it has value. It's what I refer to as a, a commodity of psychology, uh, a little bit like Bitcoin is a bit of a commodity of psychology. That being said, you know, I think a, a small allocation of gold in most portfolios is a pretty reasonable approach, uh, given its history as a counter-correlated asset. All right. You mentioned uh, Bitcoin, one of our favorite topics on the show. <laughs> and we're we're going to talk uh, Bitcoin and blockchain uh, later. We'll actually be spotlighting one of the new blockchain ETFs. But ETF.com recently had an interesting piece. It was by Debbie Carlson. I believe this was also in the May issue of the ETF report. Uh, it was titled Bitcoin Nipping at Gold Demand. And it sort of looked at whether there might be some interplay between Bitcoin and gold. Do you think it's feasible Bitcoin could impact the price of gold or demand for gold in any way? Well, you know, I think there's no question it has some impact. The question is what? I, you know, I think a lot of people refer to Bitcoin as digital gold. I mean, I just referred to it as a, a another psychological commodity. Um, and, and as a psychological commodity, it's certainly reasonable to think that somebody who might be speculating in gold might move to speculating in cryptocurrencies for similar reasons, as a flight to safety, as a kind of guns and butter, uh, you know, play against global collapse, those types of things. So I, I think it's reasonable to to draw that line and say, here is a type of investor who might be in gold. They also might be in Bitcoin. Now, whether that impacts price is a matter of magnitude. And I haven't seen any trading data yet that suggests we actually are moving the needle on gold demand, that i.e. that gold demand is off because Bitcoin demand is up or vice versa. Uh, but I think it's reasonable to think we may be headed towards that world. Gold is still an enormous trading market. Uh, and it really does dwarf the size of the markets we see in things like Bitcoin. But that may not be the case forever. Uh, the, the article you mentioned sort of brings to light some pro and cons on this argument about whether or not it matters. I think you can draw this causal connection, but I think we're probably still a ways off before you can start, say, blaming a move in gold on a counter-correlated move in Bitcoin. All right, one minute left. I'll ask you the same question about Bitcoin that I asked you about gold. Uh, is we think about this psychological commodity. How do you view Bitcoin? Are you a believer? 
I'm a believer in blockchain as a technology, and I've done a lot of research on it. I think it does some very interesting things, and I think we'll see it throughout the financial system in my lifetime. Cryptocurrency specifically, blockchain uh, and, and Bitcoin specifically, I still remain a pretty big skeptic. Uh, I think currencies really need uh, vibrant exchanges of goods and services. We haven't really seen that in Bitcoin. It doesn't mean we can't, but until we see that, until people start getting paid, and more importantly, pay their taxes, taxes in a cryptocurrency, I don't think we're going to see the kind of uh, real revolution that I think some of the biggest Bitcoin uh, proponents suggest. Dave, thanks for joining us. I look forward to chatting again next week. We'll see you soon. That was ETF.com's Dave Nodig, and you can follow him on Twitter, which is highly recommended, by the way. His Twitter handle is at Dave Nodig. That's N-A-D-I-G. Let's take a break, and when we come back, Jason and I will have a few more thoughts on Bitcoin and Bitcoin ETFs. And later, we'll be joined by Innovation Shares' Matt Markovich. He'll spotlight one of the new blockchain ETFs. You're listening to ETF Prime. back to ETF Prime, Nate and Jason in studio. So it's been at least a few weeks since we last talked Bitcoin, and uh, Bitcoin has had a rough year so far. At one point, it was down about 65% from its mid-December high of over 19000 Since then, it's been bouncing around the $9,000 range. Now, interestingly, a couple of weeks ago, the 17 millionth Bitcoin was mined. Remember, there are only 21 million Bitcoin that will ever exist. So there's some thought that maybe just the attention surrounding the limited supply of Bitcoin might help support higher prices. Though we should point out that it's supposed to take like another 120 plus years for the other 4 million coins to be mined. But you know, Jason, to me, this thing is still just so early. I think the fact that we saw Bitcoin go from over $19,000 to under $7,000 in the span of a few months speaks to that. I think the market is clearly still trying to get its head around Bitcoin and, and, and other cryptocurrencies. I continue to be fascinated by this space, but boy, you better strap in if you're going to invest here. Incredibly volatile. So that's the 17 million mark. That's around 80% of all the Bitcoin that can be mined, have been mined, around 1,800 per day last time I checked. But you mentioned it'll be, you know, 100 or 200 years before the final one is mined. That's because as the, as more and more get mined, the harder and harder, the slower and slower it gets. So it's not a linear relationship. You know, the very last Bitcoin to be mined, you know, in the next century or so will take days or months or, or weeks to actually appear. Um so there is a limited supply. Here's good news, though, Nate. Each Bitcoin is divisible into 100 million Satoshis. That's right. So when you think dollar, a dollar is divisible into pennies. Well, Bitcoin is divisible into 100 million Satoshis is the term. So anyone with a little loose change under the couch can purchase point zero 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 one Bitcoin. So good news for everyone out there. But you're, you're right. This volatility, the market, and I think the public in general are still getting their arms around this. All right, so there were two pieces you and I read recently that I think sort of offered these divergent views on Bitcoin. And the first one might come as a surprise. The St. Louis Fed, of all places, they actually had a blog where they listed three ways Bitcoin is like a regular currency. And I think when you have someone like the St. Louis Fed writing a piece like that, that has to get your attention. Now, on the other hand, research affiliates had a piece titled, Yes, it's a bubble. So what? And they highlighted different areas of the market. But one of the things they covered was Bitcoin. And let me read a quote from this piece. Quote, it boggles the imagination to hear people speaking of, quote unquote, investing in Bitcoin, an electronic entity that offers no hope of future offer, uh, operating profits or dividends, is little used as a surrogate for money and transactions, offers an uncertain longer term use case and has no objective basis to determine fundamental value. And they even make a comparison 
to Pets.com from back in the uh, the tech bubble. I mean, that's a pretty scathing take from a Rob Arnodden team. Well, first off, that's researchaffiliates.com. It, it's a great read it, for anyone who's interested in this space. It, they make a strong case, but it is a damning article. But, you know, what's interesting, some of the criticisms they have of Bitcoin, I think, also apply to gold. Well, and we talked about that earlier with Dave. Absolutely. It doesn't pay interest. What fundamental value does it really have other than people will take it off your hands? I loved his term, psychological commodity. That's it. And I think Bitcoin and to a great extent gold, you know, are governed by the greater fool theory. You know, the greater fool theory says people are willing to own things with no technical or fundamental merit at all. If there's someone in line behind him to pay more for it than they paid for it. And then that person is looking over their shoulder for their greater fool. I mean, isn't that really kind of what we're talking about when it comes to Bitcoin and gold? You want it to go up, and what technical or or fundamental value does it truly have? It's a great argument. But in the article, there were some other factoids, just some amazing ah ahas about Bitcoin in particular, the, 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 the blockchain and what the process that it takes to mine Bitcoin. It's very, very resource intensive. Amazing amounts of electricity power these banks of servers that are grinding through mathematical calculations. And the, in the article, they make the case that it's estimated that the amount of electricity in each year to mine the Bitcoin would power all the households in Los Angeles, L.A., for a year. All that electricity, the same amount to power the country of Israel for a year. Just the electricity that drives this blockchain network. And they, they, on a global basis, the figure they gave was is one quarter of 1% of global electricity use. That's a stunning amount of electricity. And what happens as the process to create more Bitcoin gets longer and longer and longer? That's built into the process. What will electric, electrical demand become? It's just mind-boggling. Yeah. And to be fair, I mean, think about all of the environmental concerns of mining gold, wow. too, if you're going to make the, the comparison to gold. You know, look, at the end of the day, gold's been around for thousands of years, Bitcoin for, what, nine years now. And so, again, not to say Bitcoin can or won't have value. I I just think it's so early. Now, in terms of the prospects for a Bitcoin ETF, not much has changed since January when the SEC released a letter where they essentially said, look, until ETF providers can answer a whole host of questions surrounding how cryptocurrency ETFs would function, and how they would satisfy the requirements of the Investment Company Act of 1940, the SEC didn't even want to see products filed for registration. And if you look at these questions, they cover everything from valuation, so how would underlying cryptos and the ETFs themselves be valued, price manipulation, liquidity, custody, arbitrage for ETFs. The SEC threw a laundry list of concerns out there, and after that, a bunch of the Bitcoin ETF filings were withdrawn. Now, the SEC did issue an order back in March asking for public comment on certain aspects of listing and trading Bitcoin ETFs on an exchange. This uh, related to the proposed ProShares Bitcoin ETF. So I do think that was a positive, but overall, it's been pretty quiet on the Bitcoin ETF front. Well, it has. Something of note, while there are no specific ETFs, there are futures. There's a marketplace. And those were launched last December. And interestingly enough, that happened to coincide with really the high point of the price of Bitcoin. Now, is that a coincidence or is that a function of market sentiment or is now I'm able to short Bitcoin where before you could only go long? So there's some moving parts there. But I think you're right. Many thought that that process of launching futures would be a spring. Might be the catalyst. Yeah, that would be the springboard. But I tell you what, the SEC threw cold water all over that. If you read through their their pushback and their filings, they are lengthy and they have a lot of questions. Well, and we've had an opportunity to speak with several people pretty plugged into what's happening with Bitcoin ETFs recently. And I want to play a few clips for you here. We had Amplify ETFs founder Christian Magoon on the program back in February. Uh, incidentally, he was spotlighting another one of the blockchain ETFs. But uh, not long after the SEC letter came out, we asked him if we could see a Bitcoin ETF anytime soon. Listen to his response. I don't believe Bitcoin ETFs are going to come to market anytime soon because of the uh, concerns expressed by the SEC. I think they're concerned about a variety of market issues with Bitcoin, including price manipulation, uh, regulation, 
um, maybe even taxation. There's a variety of kind of topics that have to be addressed. You know, as you know, they recently laid out a letter uh, to the kind of investment community of concerns that they have that they would like to see addressed, and they're fairly extensive. So I don't believe we'll see a cryptocurrency ETF here in the U.S. Um, in 2018, and I'd be I believe 2019 there could be some. I think there's some very motivated ETF sponsors and other players who'd like to see an ETF uh, be out in the marketplace. I mean, generally when there's an ETF for an asset class or a market segment, it creates a a very cost-efficient, liquid way uh, to purchase a regulated and, uh, and investment vehicle. Uh, I think that, you know, probably cryptocurrencies could use that. It would be beneficial for investors. I think um, it's just the underlying markets have to be uh, sorted through and understood a little bit more, and maybe some protections put in place before the SEC is going to bless a product like that coming to market. All right, so then in March, we had Mike Venuto on the program. He's Chief Investment Officer at Toroso. He's very plugged into the space as well. I basically asked him the same question. I do not think we will see one this year. Um, I would give it a 50% next year, and then the odds go up from there. And the reason is there are very big regulatory hurdles for the SEC to get their hands around, Um, and they've outlined them for us. And some of them in the current environment are simply insurmountable. Now, all that said, I'm going to say something a little bit hypocritical. I would love there to be a Bitcoin ETF, but at the same time, I don't think that it makes sense for Bitcoin. Right? The entire purpose of Bitcoin was to get rid of the need for a trusted third party. And it seems many investors want the ETF to step in as the trusted third party to give them exposure to Bitcoin. So there is this philosophical contradiction that makes me uncomfortable with it. That said, I do wish it existed because I would like that access for the clients that I allocate capital for. Now, I've got one more clip to play here, but Jason, I I thought Mike offered an interesting twist there in that one of the major selling points of Bitcoin is that it's decentralized, right? There's no need for a trusted third party. But an ETF meeting all of the SEC's requirements – Certainly wouldn't be, quote, unquote, decentralized. I just thought that was a, a good point. It's an excellent point. I don't think it's been talked, it has been talked about enough. There are numerous purported benefits for Bitcoin. But the seminal one, in my opinion, is the decentralized blockchain. You know, no, no one central party controls it. And for the conspiracy theorists, the people who want to be outside the system, you know, no one can tell me what to do with my resources. That is the benefit. That that truly is on top. I don't believe any true believer in Bitcoin who fundamentally values what it stands to be is really going to be that interested in an ETF. And that's, again, I, I think Mike is right in that that's a little talking out of both sides of our mouth on that. It's it's just like gold. You know, do you have that crazy Uncle Eddie that, you know, believes banks are going to fail like they did in 1929 and he keeps his gold coins in his basement? He's not even going to keep me in a safe deposit box because the bank can go away. I want to physically hold my gold, and no one's going to tell him otherwise. He's not going to use a gold ETF. He's going to buy the physical. I think the same thing applies to the Bitcoin true believers. Um, it, it, in my mind, if we do see a true Bitcoin ETF, it will most likely be for the retail crowd that you know aren't capable of owning it on their own in some fashion. Yeah, or just don't want to hassle with it. Absolutely. And you know the price exposure. All right, quickly here, also in March, we had Ed Lopez on the program. He's head of ETF product at Van Eck. And Van Eck was actually one of the ETF providers who filed for a Bitcoin ETF, the Van Eck Vectors Bitcoin Strategy ETF. Uh, they withdrew that application based on the SEC's letter. Ed pretty much echoes Christian and Mike here, but then listen to the rest of his comments. I thought these were really interesting on both blockchain and how to view cryptos. In terms of a registered product here in the U.S., we might be a little bit of a ways from a Bitcoin ETF or, or something similar. But one of the areas that that we are working on is trying to benchmark that space in general. And we have a subsidiary, an index subsidiary based in Frankfurt, our MV Index Solutions, which has created a series of indexes tracking some of the top digital assets. We actually call this space digital assets as opposed to cryptocurrencies. 
And what we really find, what we're really excited about, regardless of if we end up having a registered product or not, is the potential for the underlying technology, the, the blockchain, um, the, the potential for disruption and it to be a really transformative type of technology. And we, you know, as we consider ourselves forward thinking and kind of on the, on the edge of what's happening in the market. We want to be there. We want to uh, be able to provide insight into that space. Ed, from an investor standpoint, and, and I guess this is sort of a, a broad open-ended question, but how might they view the role of digital assets in a portfolio, you know, as a space evolves? Yeah, we've been talking to a lot of advisors about this as well. And, you know, the way we've been talking about it is almost like venture cap. There, These are, these digital assets are like little tech companies, and right now you don't know which one's going to win. There's a lot of different technologies out there, some for different applications, and you know we would take a, a diversified approach is one of the ways that we've been talking about. It. And one of the reasons why we launched uh, the digital assets, um, you know, multi digital asset indexes. But uh, we would look at it from a diversified standpoint and maybe a small sliver of your portfolio if you really have to have exposure to it. So, Jason, first, if you listen to Christian, Mike's, and Ed's comments there, it's clear the consensus is we have a ways to go before we see a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, There appears to be some fairly significant hurdles that need to be cleared uh, with the SEC before that happens. But, uh, look, I don't think there's any question investor demand will be there if and when Bitcoin ETFs are ultimately launched. Uh, In in the interim, we have seen uh, several blockchain ETFs come to market. We'll be spotlighting one here in just a moment. I think there are a lot of people who are in Ed's camp uh, in that blockchain technology has the potential for real disruption and not just because of crypto assets like Bitcoin. So, you know, I think with where we sit now, you know, we might see a a Bitcoin ETF maybe later this year, maybe 2019, maybe never. uh, But certainly blockchain technology, and that's something Dave Nottig uh, touched on in the first segment, is, is something that is captivating. It certainly is. I think it's important to... Remember that blockchain does not equal Bitcoin. I think the, the terms have come into our lexicon almost the same time, and so people have – they're not interchangeable in any sense. Bitcoin is a thing, albeit digital, and it can go to zero. It can make you rich, do a lot of different things, but it's a thing. Blockchain is a process. It's a technology. and can be applied to a wide range of industry. I'm frankly looking here – forward to learning more about it in our next segment so this should be great well let's go ahead and take a break and when we come back we'll be joined by matt markovich managing director of innovation shares he's going to spotlight one of the new blockchain etfs the innovation shares next gen protocol etf you're listening to etf prime Welcome back to ETF Prime, Nate Geraci and Jason Lank in studio. Let's go right to our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week we highlight one exchange-traded fund. There are thousands of ETFs available to invest in. ETF Prime has sorted through them all, so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the Innovation Shares Next Gen Protocol ETF, ticker symbol COIN, K-O-I-N. And joining us via phone from New York to discuss this ETF is Matt Markovich, Managing Director of Innovation Shares. Matt, a pleasure to have you on the program today. Good morning, guys. Thanks for having me. Matt, let's just dive right in here. COIN is one of four blockchain ETFs currently available to investors Walk us through the methodology. How is this ETF constructed? Sure. I appreciate you having me on. The uh, The challenge of building a thematic investment portfolio is that themes span borders and they cross sectors. And also, themes don't necessarily show up in 10 Qs and 10 Ks. Uh, therefore, using a traditional Wall Street fundamental approach to building a thematic blockchain portfolio doesn't really lend itself to, uh, you know, doing it in an efficient manner. So we take a much different approach to building our indexes. We have a cutting-edge, patent-pending index methodology, which is driven by artificial intelligence that uses a natural language processing algorithm to read through tens of thousands of reputable news stories to identify stocks related to the theme given particular keywords. 
And again, this is a completely different approach than what you know, your listeners are probably used to. And the algorithm is also able to determine how strong and how positive the sentiment is for those stocks associated with the theme. And that's kind of how we build, that's the, the, the engine by which we build the portfolios. And we follow a rules-based approach, meaning that you know, we have to have 100 million market cap minimum for each stock in the portfolio. There's a 7% maximum weight per stock. We rebalance the portfolio quarterly and reconstitute, which is when stocks are added or deleted, uh, semi-annually in December and June. And also we take a unique approach from the standpoint of we've separated the fund into four stakeholder categories. And these are how we believe investors should look at stocks that are related to blockchain technology. Matt, Those categories. You, yeah, right, go okay. ahead. I was going to ask you, can you tell us a little bit about the four categories? Sure. So uh, the four categories, um, I'll just kind of list them first, and then we can go quickly into them. Uh, cryptocurrency is payment, mining enablers, solutions providers, and adopters. And, again, because you can't really put thematic investing in certain sectors or certain geographies, this is how we feel investors should be looking at the space. So cryptocurrency is payment. These are companies that accept cryptocurrency as payment for goods or services or developing blockchain payment solutions. Mining enablers are companies that are creating equipment and or tools to enable creation of new blockchains or mining blockchains as their main business. The third category, solutions providers, these are companies that are engaged as blockchain as service providers. So they're assisting and building blockchain applications for companies and helping them create and implement them in their business models. The fourth category are the adopters, and these are stocks that are primarily using blockchain technology to increase operational efficiencies, optimize a settlement process, enhance the customer experience, or using blockchain to increase data security and integrity. And Matt, in total, how many holdings are in this ETF? There are 42 holdings currently in the ETF. We have a rule that there can be a maximum of 15 stocks in each category. So at most, the portfolio can hold 60 stocks. And each category cannot represent more than 40% of the index. Can you maybe give us an example or two of a company involved in blockchain that might surprise some people? Sure. Right now, the portfolio uh, holds a Danish stock. It's the container shipping giant Maersk, and they're using distributed ledger, distributed ledger technology uh, built by IBM, actually, to help digitize their global trade processes and increase visibility in their supply chain. More than $4 trillion in goods and service and goods are shipped each year, with 80% of consumer goods carried by the ocean shipping industry. And blockchain technology will help companies like Maersk reduce documentation and administration costs, which should help them improve margins. Another stock that's in the portfolio that people might not associate uh, as having blockchain exposure is uh, the energy giant British Petroleum, or BP. And they have invested in a peer-to-peer -peer blockchain oil and gas trading platform, which uh, is expected to be fully operational by the end of the year. There are opportunities for some massive cost savings and security improvements in the global energy trading landscape by harnessing the power of blockchain. So this is definitely an interesting play in terms of you know, a, com a company that you wouldn't think of that's involved in blockchain. Matt, this is Jason Lank. As I review the, the, the ETF, you know, what catches my eye, the secret sauce, is the artificial intelligence uh, algorithm. I, I'm curious, without getting too technical into the weeds and in, in the, the math behind it, I'm always interested in how you separate the data from the false positives. And I'll give you an example. We're seeing a lot of change, a lot of uh, innovation in the blockchain space. You know, for example, uh, you know, last year a company is making iced tea. This year they're the blockchain tea company. And I'm probably, I'm get, you know, and the, why they changed their name to blockchain, I don't know. But how does the algorithm separate the, 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 the signal from the noise? Good question, Jason. So, one of the uh, attributes of using this 
patent pending process that we have is that the algorithm is able to read below the headlines and look into news stories, as I mentioned, by reputable media sources. And the, it's able to discern sentiment and how positive the mentions and the stories are around each stock that's identified as having exposure to blockchain technology. So in your example, the algorithm is actually able to avoid including concept stocks like that in the index because the media is able to, I don't want to say sniff it out, but there's some skepticism involved around companies who may be putting blockchain in front of their name or announcing a pivot in strategy. This technology that we have and the use of a natural language processing algorithm has been commonly used in the hedge fund space for the past seven to ten years. We're bringing it to the retail investor at a very reasonable price point. A lot of hedge funds, however, use this technology to put on short-term trades, but we're using it to build a diversified portfolio for longer-term investing. And again, it's able the, 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 the algorithm is able to actually separate the wheat from the chaff, if you will. Our guest is Matt Markovich, Managing Director of Innovation Shares. We're spotlighting the Innovation Shares Next Gen Protocol ETF, ticker symbol COIN, K-O-I-N. Matt, I'm curious, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get involved in this space? Uh, I uh, was at a small ETF provider called iShares. You may have heard of that. <laughs> right. Uh, for, uh, for, for over six years and uh, had a, a great experience there. Um, wanted to do something a little more entrepreneurial in the uh, exchange traded fund space, and I um, met a few partners who had this extremely interesting technology, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, our, our NLP algo, and they had a great idea to launch indices and build ETFs utilizing this very powerful technology. And I thought it was a great idea and a completely unique approach to building indexes, and the indexing world is definitely ready to be turned on its head, and uh, that was the start of things. And um, you know, I was able to leverage a lot of my background from iShares and kind of uh, you know, the pedigree there to help you know, the, the partnership here and, and to build innovation shares. All right. Well, let's talk about the investment thesis here. Uh, give us the overall investment case for blockchain. This is an early stage theme. That's the, the first thing to re remember, where the, the positive impact and the full effect of this transformational technology has really still yet to play out. So think about it as the Internet 20, 25 years ago. You didn't really have a, much of an idea what it would mean to your everyday life back then, but now, of course, it's nearly impossible to live without it. That's where we think blockchain is right now. Um, and there are applications that haven't even been, de been developed yet that you're going to end up taking for granted 10 to 15 years down the, down the road. A lot of the applications right now are more from a business-to-business -business or B2B standpoint, and you know, they may not necessarily be impacting your everyday life, but you're going to see this transformational technology start to creep in and uh, you know, into your everyday life, and companies are going to be using blockchain not only to help drive revenue, but to increase operational efficiencies, again, which should, which should lead to an increase in um, you know, or margins, and you know, hopefully the companies that are using blockchain versus their competitors are going to be able to show that you know, they're, they're more valuable to that extent. Matt, sort of on that note, you know, we have spotlighted some of the other blockchain ETFs previously. And with all of them, I know one of the main criticisms is that they don't really provide direct exposure to blockchain. So if you look at the top holdings in Coin, for example, there are companies like Visa, Microsoft, Amazon, BP, where blockchain, at least right now, is a small piece of what they do. I'm just curious, how do you respond to, to that sort of criticism? It's a criticism we've heard often. And, again, these are companies that um, are, you know, they have the war chests right now to be developing from an R&D standpoint uh, blockchain applications to be able to deploy in their operations, and, you know, these are the public companies that we're seeing 
and that are using blockchain, but there are many companies that should be accessing the capital markets in the years ahead, the smaller companies, more of the pure play companies that are going to be coming to market, and it's our hope that they'll be included in our index from that standpoint. The thing that I want to point out is a lot of these you know, larger you know, cap companies, they have the resources to be able to build out blockchain applications right now. And that's why they're the, the, the more obvious ones as compared to, say, some of the smaller cap companies. So it's, it's, that's where the state of the industry or the, the theme is right now. That's not to say that it's gonna, the portfolio is going to look similar in a year to 24 months. Matt, we have just a, a couple of minutes left here. I, I think most people are probably familiar with blockchain primarily because of Bitcoin. Uh, though I, I think, as you've highlighted, obviously there are many potential uses for blockchain outside of Bitcoin and other cryptos. Uh, but if for whatever reason the crypto market uh, were to completely melt down, how big of a risk do you think that is for blockchain-related companies? Of course there's always a, some headline risk, but if you actually look at, again, these companies that are you know, in our portfolio, um, there there has not been – a high correlation to the decline in cryptocurrency prices, to the uh, movement of the of the ETF since we launched it on January 30th, and um, so I really don't see much of an overlap at all um, because again the cryptocurrency space is quite separate from how a lot of the companies in the portfolio are harnessing the power of blockchain. Matt, this is Jason again. We're just down to just a minute or so. One something interesting I noted in the ETF is that uh, from a country standpoint, you're really only around 60, 65 percent United States. And that signals to me that blockchain is by no means does the United States have a monopoly on that. This is a worldwide phenomenon. Is that a fair statement to make? Yes, Jason, that's a very fair statement. And I would expect uh, over the coming years for the um, exposure to U.S. companies to actually decline as you know, developers across the world continue to build out you know, applications for blockchain. And you know, that's coming from all regions, whether it be Europe, Asia, Latin America. So that's a very fair statement. And, again, that's, that's kind of where our process lends itself to really building a diverse portfolio for investors, not only from an uh, industry perspective, but from a geographical perspective as well. Matt, 30 seconds. Uh, where does a CTF fit in an investor's portfolio? We view it as fitting very well into a international or global equity portion of the portfolio where you may be looking for slightly higher growth in terms of your outlook for the stocks in the basket. And it's been resonating well with investors. So, again, so it's a more of a global equity growth sleeve, that's where you would want to allocate coin. Well, Matt, we'll have to leave it there. A great spotlight. Congratulations on the ETF, and best of luck to you. Nate, Jason, thank you very much for having me on. That was Matt Markovich, Managing Director of Innovation Shares. Again, the ETF is the Innovation Shares Next Gen Protocol ETF, and you can learn more about this ETF by visiting innovationshares.com. So, Jason, there are four blockchain ETFs on the market. Two of them are index-based. One's actively managed, and this one uses artificial intelligence, also index-based, but uses AI to ultimately select underlying holdings. It's a pretty unique concept. Well, I, it's when you step back and think about it, you're combining artificial intelligence and blockchain, two of the buzzwords in our industry. You know, what kind of match is that? It's, it's going to be interesting. Now, this is a young fund, and it's just getting started, so we'll see how it, how it rolls out. But uh, certainly, if you're interested in the space, at both spaces, this is, this, this is a, an area to take a look at. Well, as I said earlier, I'm just going to be fascinated watching this entire space of all, whether yeah. we're talking blockchain yeah. or Bitcoin, and especially in, on the ETF side of the equation. This is going to be uh, really, really fascinating to follow. All right, that'll do it for today's show. Podcasts of ETF Prime are available at etfprime.com, Apple iTunes, and Google Play. You can follow us on Twitter, at Nate Geraci and at Jason Lank. Next week, the focus of our show will be emerging markets. We'll be joined by Kevin Carter, CEO of Big Tree Capital, and the man behind the Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce ETF. We'll go in-depth on emerging market stocks. 
Until then, have a great week, everyone. 